We are going to go straight into the word of God. And I trust that the Lord will speak to us again as usual. I want to encourage you, let your heart be open to receive the word of God. Let your heart be open for the spirit of God to speak to you. Amen. So last week, we started speaking on the topic. What was the topic? Let me see if you still remember. Doing what? Building up a memorial. Building up a memorial before God. And we spoke extensively last week. In fact, somebody that I did not even know saw the, the video sent me a message early this morning. Sent me a message this morning. He said that he has watched the video, that he was so blessed and all that. So I will encourage you, if you are not here last week, or even if you are here, go and listen to it again. It will bless you. So today we want to move on to the second part of that teaching. Building up a memorial before God. Last week, we were introduced to the key character. Who was our key character last week? I will always test you. I will always test you. You should expect that for now, by now. The centurion. What's the name of the centurion? Cornelius. Cornelius. Okay. I hope you didn't say Nicodemus. <laughs> Good. Cornelius. And you know, the Lord taught us from the scriptures about this character, Cornelius. He was a devout man. You remember? He always prayed. He always gave arms to the poor, so he was in the service of God. And then, what happened to him? Who appeared to him? An angel appeared to him. Can I have more power in this microphone, please? An angel appeared to him. Amen. An angel appeared to him and told him, send for Peter. And he sent for Peter. Peter came, spoke to him and his family. They were saved. They received the Holy Ghost. But what was the crux of our message? That God pays attention. Hallelujah. Are we together? God pays attention. I want to read some of the translations I gave you last week. God pays attention to our prayers and to our service to God. One of the transitions said, when the angel was talking to, to, to Cornelius, he said, your prayer and alms to the poor as reason before God, as what? As a sacrifice to be remembered. If you wrote it down last week, please look at it again. It has risen as a sacrifice to be remembered. Another one says, it has been recorded on high before God, which means whenever we serve God, whenever we pray, it is recorded on high. Another one says, your prayer and your alms to the poor as ascended as worthy as an offering worthy to be remembered. And finally, another one said that God has observed and remembered your prayers and your arms to the poor. Your prayer and your service to God. May the Lord give us grace in Jesus' name. So we spoke extensively. I'm not going to go over all that we discussed last week. But today, we want to look into the scriptures in details. Into the life of one man. Just this morning, for the next few minutes, we want to look into the life of a particular man who also built a memorial before God. Most of us know a side of the story, but we want to step into the deep waters today so that you will understand that, you see, in the kingdom, nothing happens by accident. Praise the Lord. Somebody said, salvation is free. That's true. But after salvation, God expects you now to show appreciation for what he has done. By serving him. By staying in his presence. By bringing others to him. To show that you appreciate what he has done. So the word of the Lord in the book of Isaiah told us a particular story. We are starting from the end. Then we will roll back to the back. To the beginning. I beg your pardon. So the word of the Lord in the book of Isaiah chapter 38. Told us the story of a man or a king in Israel called Ezekiah. We are going to do a lot of reading today. So prepare your mind. He told us the story of a particular king. The name of the king was Ezekiah. So let me paraphrase the story quickly. And I know a lot of us have heard the story before. Ezekiah was a king. In fact, he was a good king. Amen. But one day, he fell sick. And he fell so sick that, you know, everybody was worried. He was on the sick bed. Even he himself was worried. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. Then all of a sudden, the prophet at that time was prophet Isaiah. Praise God. And prophet Isaiah showed up 
in the palace of Ezekiah. And he asked to see Ezekiah. Of course, Isaiah, as a prophet, was highly respected. So they took him into the bedroom of Ezekiah where he was. And they were well acquainted. If you read history, you will see that they were well acquainted. There was another prophet also at that time who was also, you know, prophesying in Israel by name Ozia. Ozia was not on the same rank with Isaiah. Isaiah was the prophet. Ozia was one of the prof other prophets. Praise God. Ozia was also around in the days of Ezekiah the king. So now, Isaiah entered into the bedroom of Ezekiah. And Ezekiah was there on what was supposed to be his deathbed. He was supposed to just die there. And Isaiah came with the word of the Lord. Isaiah said, Thus said the Lord, King Ezekiah, you are falling sick, you will not recover from this sickness. What kind of bad prophecy is that one? You know, if it was a small prophet, you say, ah, please, please, everybody, chase this man out. Go and call the senior prophet to come and change it. But you see, the one that came, it was the senior prophet himself that came. And he said, this is what the Lord said. It's not that he was angry with Ezekiah. He said, this is what the Lord said. And he spoke to him. He said, you will not recover. Put your house in order. And he turned around. You know, prophets at times can be unfriendly. How can you make that declaration of death and be able to turn around and go? I thought you, you would sit down there and also cry with him for a bit. He didn't cry. He just said, Thus said the Lord, put your house in order. You will not recover. You will die on this bed, says the Holy One of Israel. And he turned around and he left. And as he was going, Ezekiah turned to the wall. And this is where I'm going. And he made an interesting prayer to the Lord. He did not say, Lord, save me now. God, don't let me die like this. He said, oh Lord, remember how I have served you and how I did very well and did good things as the king of this land. Lord, just remember. And the Bible said, he started crying. The king on his deathbed, the Bible said he cried all within a short time. And before Isaiah could get to the gate of the palace, the word of the Lord came to him again. Go back to Ezekiah. Go and tell him, I have heard your prayers. I have seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. Is that not an interesting story? But you know, it must also be that Ezekiah has done something for the Lord. Am I making sense to you? I mean, what kind of audacity will you have to face the God that has said, I'm waiting to meet you face to face? To now say, God, remember. If you have not done anything, would you be able to say that? So today we want to dive a bit into the life of Ezekiah. This is to be an inspiration for us and a challenge for us to know that after we become born again, it's not bed and roses. It's not all comfort and once there is a little discomfort, you escape through the window. No. Once we become born again, our lives must become lives dedicated to God. We must become like Cornelius, devoted to God. Many people in our days think that God is just um, a big man sitting up there with baskets of blessings, looking for who to give. No, he's not like that. He has blessings. He's a good and a great God. But do you know what? He calls for service. He calls for relationships. And to get the best of God, you must build a relationship with him. You also must serve him. These are the standards of the scriptures. Hallelujah. Can I have the pointer? Can I have the pointer, please? All right. So let's go to that Isaiah chapter 38. And I want to read that story. I'm going to read verses 1 to 8. And Isaiah chapter 38, I'm going to read from verse 1 to 8. To to eight. Give me a simple translation. Okay, so let's use this. If you are still here, say amen. amen. If you are still here, say a good amen. amen. It says, in those days, Ezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. Does this align with the story I just told you? Because now, I, I know if I paraphrase it, and then we read, it's easier for people to understand. 
right? So in those days, Ezekiah, that is the king, was ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, what kind of prophet? The prophet. Not a prophet. There is a huge difference in it when you are reading the Bible and you see a prophet, the prophet. They, 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 they pass to you two different messages. So he says, the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, hear this. Thank you. This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. Is this not scary? You know, I thought when prophets show up, it's to bring word of comfort. Not all the time. Let's go on. So Ezekiah turned his face to the wall. Did he argue with Isaiah? Ezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Now, see the kind of prayer. Remember. Let somebody say remember. remember. I can't hear you. Remember. Because this God is a God that remembers. Whatever you do, he remembers. What did we say last week that he keeps? He keeps what? He keeps a record. There are, there, there are books in heaven. Even the Bible in the book of Revelation told us, in the Revelation chapter 20, told us that those books are books of what? Records. They are books of records. So whether you believe it or not, there is a book of record in heaven concerning you. Concerning what you are doing. Concerning how you are living your life. Concerning your sacrificial service in the house of God. There is a record in heaven. There are books there. And there are times that God remembers. He calls to remembrance the things that you have done, the sacrifices that you have made. Most of the time, the Lord will call you to remembrance in your time of need. You remember the golden bowls of the angels? When the prayers are offered, those, it is the time of need that the Lord will open those golden bowls and say, well, does he have anything inside? Does she have anything inside? So what did he say to God? Now, the words of Ezekiah. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully. And with wholehearted devotion, with, and with wholehearted devotion, and have done what is good in your eyes. And Ezekiah wept bitterly. Now he was standing before God. He must be very confident of what he has done in the past. Am I making sense to you? You know, man can lie to man. If I look at uh, Broduna and I, and I want him to be impressed, I can start exaggerating certain things that I've done. Say, you know what? When I was coming this morning, I came in my Ferrari and, you know, I parked it. I, you know, I don't like to park close to the church so that I won't look th out through the window and say, let's see it. So, you know, I, I like to park at the back so that, you know, it is a sign of humility. You know, you can start exaggerating things. But when you are with God, can you exaggerate? Why? Why? He knows all things. In fact, you know what the Bible says in one, one particular passage of the scripture? Is that he perceives your thought from afar. Do you know what that means? Imagine that you are standing like this. The thought is not yet in your heart. The thought is coming to you. God, before the thought gets to your heart, into your own heart, God can see the thought coming. He's about to think that's how, how <laughs> all knowing he is. That's how omniscient, all knowing he is. He perceives our thoughts from afar. Before you even think it, he knows what you are going to think. Not what you are even going to do. You know what you are doing, going to do is after you think it. I say before you even think it. Hallelujah. Before your mother met your father, he knew what you were going to be like. He already created you in the womb of the morning, according to the scriptures. That is what is called the womb of the morning. Where we all were before we were conceived. He knew you. He knew who you were going to become, what you were going to look like. Your assignment, he connected it to you at that time before your parents met each other. That's how omniscient he is. That's how powerful he is. So, Ezekiah knew well enough not to lie to that kind of person. In fact, if what he said was a lie, it would speed up his death. He will not even have time to say goodbye. God is ah, in my very before before you are even lying. In my very presence. Okay. So, and Ezekiah wept bitterly. Now look at this. Immediately, 
the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Immediately. Go on. Go and tell Ezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. You see, if someone is on the deathbed and the word of the Lord comes to the person and says, now you have 15 years more. Someone that was thinking he would die right there. Do you know that is a good news? In fact, it's beyond good news. Give me the right words to use. What kind of news is that? It's, it's superlative news. He will, he, he, he will be overjoyed. That, wow, so I'm not going to die right now. Okay, I still have 15 years. I can still do a lot more things in this world. Am I making sense to you? But what could have provoked that change of mind? God, the same God that said you will die, now says you are not dying anymore. Just because Ezekiah made a statement. It was just a simple a statement to God. Lord, remember. Lord, remember. Remember. Ah, I can't go like this. Lord, remember. Remember how, how I have served you. How I have done the right things. How I, have walk, how, how I have walked before you blamelessly. Lord, remember. You see, in this life, there will be days of trouble. Ecclesiastes was speaking. He says, remember the days of darkness, for there shall be many. So in this world, there will be days of darkness for every human being. For every human being, there will be days of darkness. There will be days of trouble. There will be days of confusion. There will be days of fear. It does not matter how anointed you are. There will be days when you would not know what to do, where you would not have anywhere to turn to except God. I've shared the story with you before. Many years ago, I was on the sick bed, terribly sick. The doctors examined me. And the doctors were even confused themselves. They were wondering what kind of illness is this? They did everything they could. Nothing was changing. And one by one, the internal organs in this same man standing before you started shutting down. So at the point, they told me that it was only my heart that was just breathing. So they were waiting. Hallelujah. And you know, I, just like Ezekiah, I also turned to the wall. I said, Lord, remember how I have served you. I have nothing else to say. I have no. I was too weak. It was even a whisper because I was too weak. And right there and then, the Lord took me into a revelation. Right on the sick bed. Your work with God must be deep. I'm talking, I was sick. I could not even move myself. Then, I don't even know whether to call it a revelation because it was reality, actually. And I saw myself outside that hospital bed, the hospital building, I saw myself come outside it. I was still on the bed. But I saw myself come outside. And right outside, there was a pillar, a silver pillar from wherever, I don't know where it started from, going up into the clouds. And there was a flat platform around it. And myself and about three or four other people were on it. I couldn't see their faces. And the thing was like an elevator. And it was taking us into the clouds. You know what that means? And as we were going, I was helpless. I could not shout. Even right there, out of curiosity, I looked down and I saw people going about their businesses. And people were just moving. It was an open place. Those who were taking buses were taking... People were just going about their businesses. They did not notice that we were there. And the thing was going up on that pole, like an elevator. But all of a sudden, glory to God. Hallelujah. Something jolted me from there and flung me back into the hospital room. And I landed back in my body on the bed. And I realized what has happened. You know, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, the Bible says, remember the silver cord. When the Bible was saying, remember now, the Lord thy God in the days of thy youth. You understand? Before the keepers of the hand begin to tremble, that means your hands. Before the light goes dim, your eyes. Hallelujah. Before the grinders begin to fall up. What are the grinders? You see, you must interpret the scriptures. It, then, when he went and went, because that's not what I'm teaching today. When he went for that, he said, before the silver cord is broken. Before the silver cord, can you see? The silver cord. 
There are deep things in scriptures. You must become a student of the scriptures. Then you will understand a lot of things. He said, before the silver cord is broken, that is before your life is taken away. What am I saying? In the day of trouble, can you turn to the Lord? Do you have anything you can point at? And say, Lord. Because you see, at that time, you hold on to anything you can hold on to. Am I making sense to you? You will hold on to anything you can hold on to and say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God says, I've heard your prayer. And I've seen your tears. That day, when I found myself back on the bed, tears streamed from my eyes like water. I knew what was going on. I knew what was going on. And all I could do was turn to God and say, Lord, please step in. Intervene. And one by one, to the amazement of the doctors, they will come, they will say, ah, the system is waking up again. What is going on? The system is waking up again. And one by one, my entire body system woke up again. Up till today, they can't explain it. The day I was discharged after 12 days in the hospital, as I was going, the whole hospital, the doctors, the nurses, they were at attention. Everybody left what they were doing. They came to the reception. They were looking at me like this. The senior doctor said, he is walking. Do you know what that means? He didn't know. He said, he's, he's walking. He's walking. Oh. And I looked at all of them. I waved at them. I was still very weak. I waved at them. My brother that went with me just took me, took me into the vehicle. And I sat down. I was in bed, bed fast for another three months. But I survived it. Hallelujah. I'm here. I survived it. Do you know? That was 28 years ago. 28 years ago. 28 years ago. I survived it. But it was the hand of God that delivered me. Up till today, because the senior doctor happens to be a friend of the family, when he sees me, I don't know how to say this in, in English. When he sees me, he says, Ah! A Yorubo. You know what that means? Yoruba people. Say the one that has that saw heaven like this and came back. <laughs> That's what he calls me till today. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hear me, friends. The days of darkness, the days of trouble are bound to come to human beings. And in those days, it's only God that can save you. Now, if you do not have a relationship with the Lord, what will you do on that day? If you have not learned to pray, what will you do? If you have not learned to build a personal relationship talking with the Lord, in the day of your trouble, what will you do? So this man, Hezekiah, the king, he did not just become a useless man because he was the king and he had all the resources. He spent his life and his resources in the service of God. So in the day of his trouble, he said, Lord, remember. Is there anything you can point to God again and say, Lord, I remember how I used to clean the church. Have mercy on me. Do you know God will remember? Remember how I used to take care of your saints and the children. Do you know God will remember? But do you have anything you can point at? Because you see, there are a lot of strange te teachings that are going around nowadays. You, say, you know, just ask the Lord and the Lord will do. It's not always like that. Though. At times, you can have a covenant with the Lord. You can have a covenant with the Lord. You remember I was also telling you that you cannot compare yourself with other people. You don't know their personal work with the Lord. You don't know the kind of commitment, the kind of agreement they have built with the Lord. Have you built such? You still have an opportunity. Because you see, the church, when we come together like this, is a place, is a place to learn. To learn the word of God and to learn how to work with the Lord. Don't joke with it. Let's go on. He says, so I've added 15 years to your life. I'm going to verse 8. Because we're still warming up. We've not even started today. Let's go on, sir. Now, see, hear this. He begged for his own life. Am I correct? When God shows up to bless you, to answer your prayers, he will always do more than you ask for. Did you hear what I said? 
if you pray and your prayer touches heaven and God shows up to one side, he will, always, he will not just one side. He will always give you extra. So he said, I've added 15 years to your life and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. Sennacherib. How many of us know the story of Sennacherib? I think I've taught you that before. Now hear this. Because he was the king, this was important to him. He said, I will do what? I will defend this city. Let's go. This is the Lord's sign to you. Now, this is interesting. Watch this again. He cried to the Lord. The Lord heard his prayers and saw his tears. The Lord said, I will give you 15 years extra. The Lord did not stop there. He said, I will also give you a sign. Praise God. Hallelujah. He said, this is the Lord's sign to you. That the Lord will do what he has promised. Because it's possible for him to doubt. Now, what was the sign? He says, I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back ten steps. It has gone down on the stairway of hairs. So the sunlight went back the ten steps. It had gone down. You don't understand it. What did God do? If you understand it, explain it to us. Not exactly. Think very well. Look at it and think very well. What did the Lord do? You reverse the time. You know the shadow keeps going. He said, I will make the shadow do what? Go back. What has he done? So imagine if it was 11 o'clock. And because of one man, God says, everybody's looking at the time, it's 11 o'clock. I, the Lord, now decide that it shall be 10 now. Say, but Lord, it's already 11. He said, it's a sign to Ezekiah. He did the impossible. For those who have built a memorial before God, for them, impossibilities will become possible. In the day of their need, there will be possibilities. May that be your story. Amen. In the name of Jesus. So I've told you today, we want to look at the life of Ezekiah. So why did Ezekiah have that confidence? And I want you to relax. Give me the, that translation, H, uh, HSBC or something like that. I always never remember that acronym. Now hear me. Why did he have that kind of confidence? To be able to say, Lord, remember. Imagine I'm talking to you. And you say, uh, Pastor, remember yesterday. And I, you know instantly I'll start thinking. What happened yesterday? Am I correct? And God, who created yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You have the confidence to tell him, Lord, remember. More like, remember what happened between us yesterday. You must have done something. So we want to explore for the next few minutes. And that's what we are doing today. The life of Ezekiah, when he became king. Let's go to the book of 2 Kings chapter 18 from verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 18. We want to look quickly at the life of Ezekiah. How he became king, or when he became king, and the kind of things he did. So I'm going to read eight verses again to see the kind of king he was. In the third year of Israel's king, Gojia, son of Elah, at this time, if you're a student of the Bible, you will know that at a point, Israel, the country, the kingdom broke into two. Do you understand? There are 12 tribes of Israel. They broke into two. Ten continued to be called Israel. Two was called Judah. But they were all still the people of God. You, do you understand? So, there was the king of Israel. Hezekiah was the king of Judah. So in the third year of Israel's king, Ozziah, Ozziah, son of Elah, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, became the king of Judah. So can, do you understand it now? The king of Judah. So let's follow it. He was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 20, 29 years in Jerusalem. So together, how old was he? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for to the mathematicians. His mother's name was Abi, daughter of Zechariah. Let's go. Let's go. I'm going to it. Now, watch this. The writings, the record of the Lord concerning Ezekiah. Watch this. He did what was right in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. <laughs> Do you know what it means for 
You know, we read about David last week. When we read about God's covenant to David, you remember it now? God said, Ezekiah did the right thing. How? Look at it. This is the Bible. I want you, you must love the scriptures. You must become students of the scriptures. So God compared him to who? Talk to me, talk to me. To who? To David. He said, look, he did the right things just like David, his father, his ancestor, did. Good. So when God looks at us, when God looks at me, and he wants to assess all my Christian service and my work with him, can God say, he did the right thing, just like the fathers of old who did well? It's important to God. These are the reasons why Ezekiah had the confidence to speak to the Lord. It's still long ago, but we'll take it one step after the other. We'll stop where our time permits us. Let's go. Now, begin to look at what he did. The Bible said, he removed the high places and shattered the sacred pillars. You might not understand what this is if you are not a student of the Bible. Let me give you a little background. Now, the kings before Ezekiah were very bad kings. They were kings in, in Judah and in Israel, but they were very bad. You know part of the things they did? They went to the temple of the Lord, right? And removed the things there. Are we together? Flung them aside. Some even took some of the things there, took it to their palace, and they were using it. Things that were meant for the temple of the Lord. To make it worse, some of them now took idols. Not only were they worshipping Baal or the Ashtoreth outside, they took those idols, they took it into the temple. And they said people should be worshipping it right there in the temple of God. Am I making sense to you? How do you think God felt? They did all that, all that. Then after a while, by the time, just before, uh, what's his name, Ezekiah took over, they stopped the sacrifices of the temple. So no more sacrifices in the temple. No more worship of God in the temple. In fact, they shut down the temple. Completely, they shut it down. So it was almost like God was not in their midst anymore. And they were not worshipping God anymore. And it was in the midst of that, that Ezekiah became the king. Now, he began to do the right things. Hear me, friends. When you are doing the right thing, it will seem like you are a fool. It will seem like you don't even know how to enjoy life. But do you know what happens? God takes note of it. God is keeping a record of it. Such that in the day of your need, you will be glad you did the right thing. So what did he do? The Bible said he removed the high places and shattered the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. These are poles. These are idol, um, what do you call it? idolatrous images that people were worshipping instead of worshipping God. The Bible said Ezekiah, what did he do? He brought them down. He shattered them. He broke them. He cut them down. Look at this. He broke into pieces the bronze snake that Moses made. Now, this is another thing. How many of you remember the bronze stick that Moses made? That they will, in the desert and they will lift up. It was God that told Moses to make it. Why did God tell him to make it? Where are the Bible students? Where are the Bible students? What was happening to the Israelites in the wilderness at that time? I will always test you. Just get used to it. What was happening to them? Snakes were doing what? Were, were attacking them. Am I making sense? So snakes were attacking them, and they were dying, and they were afraid. Then God told Moses, he said, okay, take a stick. Make a bronze image of a snake on it, and lift it up. So whoever looks at that Brozen uh, image of the snake will not be beaten by snakes, will be saved. What does that typify? The cross of Christ. The same way Jesus was lifted up on the cross. That was a type and a shadow. Am I making sense? That the same way Christ will be lifted up, that whosoever looks at him will not be beaten by the snake. Who is the snake? The serpent. Who is the serpent? The devil, Satan. The Bible called him the ancient dragon, the serpent. It was the same serpent that showed up in Genesis that deceived Adam and Eve. Am I correct? So it was a type and a shadow. Now, that stick and bruising snake, they did not throw it away. 
When the thing finished this work, what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to discard it. They kept it. It has been there since that time. Now look at. They said, Ezekiah broke into pieces the brazen snake, the bronze snake that Moses made. Why? For the Israelites burned incense to it. What were they doing to it? They started worshipping it. They burned incense to it. Up to that time. And they call, he called it what? Nehushtan. You know how God can do something good and bring a blessing and then you begin to worship the blessing? <laughs> Am I making sense? You know how God can use a man of God so greatly? Then we begin to worship the man of God. And we forget that it is actually God that we should worship. And we then begin, we forget. And we then begin to worship that man. So if he says, everybody eats grass now, you can't think again. Praise the Lord. You can't think again. You eat grass. Praise God. One brought um, the tall. He said, because the Bible says, if you drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. So he told his members to line up. I'm telling you true life. And started giving them the toll to drink. One brought a live snake. So he said, because the Bible says they shall pick up serpents. While he was trying to even make them touch the snake, the snake said, beat him. Don't worship people. It's an error. Don't worship the blessings of God. It is an error. God was the one that told Moses, make that brazen snake. But when God finishes with something, he discards it. He is the only one that must be worshipped. Am I making sense to you? So Ezekiah had an understanding of the worship of God. That look, our hearts must not be divided in the worship of God. We must worship God and him alone with the whole of our heart. Am I making sense to you? And then, because they were burning incense to it and they have turned it to an idol, what did Ezekiah do? Ezekiah destroyed it and he, he you know, he, he, how did the Bible say? He broke it into pieces because they were burning incense to it. Let's go. Verse 5. I'm going to verse 8. Ezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel. See the kind of life he lived. Not one of the kings of Judah was like him. Am I making sense to you? See the kind of person that could challenge God in the day of his own trouble. Because he served God devotedly. Wholehearted devotion. The Bible says not one of the kings of Judah was like him. Either before him or after him. See the kind of qualification. Whether before him or after him, not one of the other kings was like him. Hallelujah. Let's go. Look at this. He held fast to the Lord. Let somebody say he held fast. He held fast. To, the Lord. to the Lord. Now say it. I will hold fast, I will hold fast. To, the to the Lord. You know many of us, once there is a little problem, we change it for God. You say God, if you are really God, answer this thing now. If you don't see the answer, Lord, I will see you later. Or in fact, I'm going. That's not how to work with the Lord. You want to work with the Lord? You must do what? Talk to me. Hold fast. These are the people that will see the real blessings of the Lord. These are the people that God will rise up for in the time of their need. They are the ones who hold fast to God in their own personal life and in their work with God. The Bible said he held fast to the Lord and did not turn from following him, but kept the commandments the Lord had commanded Moses. He kept all the commands of God. All the commandments, he kept them. He kept working with the Lord. Let's go. Now watch this. If, I mean, if you hold fast to the Lord, will the Lord push you away? So, so the Lord was with him. And wherever he went, he what? He prospered. So you see, people who are looking for prosperity all over the place. So you want to prosper, you run there. There's one program there. Oh, there is one man of God there. That's not how to prosper. You want to prosper? Hold fast to the Lord. 
You walk with the Lord. Serve him with wholehearted devotion. Give your all to him one on one. You have a responsibility in his house. Discharge it to the best of your strength and ability. You will be amazed. Now watch this. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Verse 8. But look at. He defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza. As far as where? Gaza. Where are they fighting now? Gaza. It's the same Gaza. In case you don't know. That's not what I want to talk about today. As far as Gaza and its borders, from watchtower to fortified city. He defeated his enemies. Why? Because he held on to God and he served God. But we have not even seen anything. Because you see, we are reading now from Second Kings. The book of Kings just spoke generally about the kings. What did, you know, just like a summary. But if you want to now see the details of what he did, we cannot finish it in this service today. Because when we now go to the book of Chronicles, you see the book of Chronicles is the book of records of kings. One by one. Some of them is only five verses. Because all the things he did were not worthy of record. He wasted the entire time. He told them, he said, hey, when he came, sir, he gave birth to four children. Uh, and the Bible will always summarize, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord. God will not even dignify that evil with details. He will just say, hey, he did evil. Close his chapter. But when we got to Ezekiah, let's go to the book of Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 29. And the book of Chronicles is a very practical book. If you have not done anything, <laughs> you cannot fabricate it. Am I making sense to you? From 29, 2 Chronicles chapter 29, chapter 29, chapter 30, chapter 31, chapter 32. When some people had only five verses, oh, chapter 32, up to the end of chapter 32, was speaking about Ezekiel. And how he worked with the Lord. And I'm going to read a few of these things to you. Why am I doing this? For you to know that it is possible to build a memorial before God. It's possible for you to serve God in a way that even God himself will notice. It's possible for you to do things in the kingdom, in the house of God, that the Lord himself will recognize that somebody is doing something. That was the story of Cornelius, wasn't it? That Cornelius did not even know that God was taking record. Because he was not even a Jew. He did not even know that God was taking records. He did not even know that the whole of heaven was seeing what he was doing. He just did it out of a devout heart to the Lord. He was devoted to the Lord. And he did everything he did as unto the Lord. Not knowing that God was taking records. Hear me friends. Whether you believe it or not. All our days are written in his book. All my days are written in his book. All that I'm doing are written in his book. And those books will not be lost because on the last day, according to Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says the books will what? Will be opened. May there be good records for you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. We are going to read the same story again, but now from the book of Chronicles. And I'm going to start by reading 11 verses. Today is just for us to read scriptures and understand that it is possible to build a memorial before God. That you can also, in the way you serve God and give your life and your heart to him, you can build a memorial before God. So that in the day of need, even a whisper from you will shake the heavens. Ezekiah was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. I thought we saw this before. So you see a lot of repetition, but you see additional information. Are we together? His mother's name was Abijah. What changed in this mother's name? Good. You see, you need to pay attention. So that one, in fact, they even summarized the name. So the, mother, the mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. Please, sir, we have to move fast. The summary of the whole story. He did what was right in the Lord's sight. Just as his ancestor David 
had done. Is this not beautiful? We have seen this before. Now, you are now going to see details. How we serve God. Why God listened to him in the day of trouble. The kind of things that he did that gave him the confidence to say, Lord, talk to me. What did he say to God? He told God, he said, Lord, remember. He said, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, can you see that this one is very detailed? So on January of the year of his reign, they don't call their own January, but at least for us to understand. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, what did he do? He opened the doors of the Lord's temple and repaired them. What did I tell you about the temple of the Lord before he became king? Talk to me. They had shut it down. They had shut it down. Time will fail me, the kind of things that I want to talk about. They had shut down the door of the temple where God was worshipped. They had shut it down. So they were no longer worshipping the Lord. They were no longer offering the sacrifices. They worship as they, they if, you, if you know about the temple setting, they no longer burned incense to the Lord. The table of showbread was just there now, empty. They've shut it down. Nobody worshiped before the Ark of Covenant anymore. Are we together? They were not worshiping the Lord anymore. They just closed everything down. But the Bible said, in the first month, the moment he became king, what was the first thing he did? He opened the door of the temple. Are you doing any special things in the kingdom? Are you serving God in any way that will touch the heart of God? He opened the doors of the Lord's temple. And what did he do to the doors? He repaired. He, they have abandoned the temple. Even the doors are now bad. But when Ezekiah became the king, he looked at the temple of the Lord. He said, this cannot be the temple of my God. He opened the doors and repaired it. Let's go, sir. I'm going to 11. Then he brought in the priest and Levite and gathered them in the eastern public square. Did he gather them in the temple? Who are these people? The priest. No, sir. Go back to four. I'll tell you when to move. He brought in the priest and the Levite. These are the people that are supposed to be serving God, coordinating the worship. He had to go and be looking for them. There was no more worship. He was looking. Are you doing anything in the service of God? Do you see anything going wrong in the church of God and you step in to correct it? Or in fact, you yourself, you are a problem. That once you show up, if there were 50 before, 50 problems before it multiplies to 250. You know, some people themselves, they are a bundle of problems. So once they show up, even God will say, Chai, why did this one come today? <laughs> Hallelujah. But do you resolve issues? Do you get to the house of God and say, ah, this is not going well. We must correct it. Am I making sense to you? This is not going well. Or you even see the one that is going well, you say, we must cut it. So he gathered the Levites and the priests. They could not, for you to understand how much the temple has gone into disrepair, they could not even gather in the temple. He gathered them in the public square. Like what we call the market square. For those of us who have lived in the villages. Let's go, sir. He said to them, Hear me, Levites, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the Lord God of your ancestors. Remove everything detestable from the holy place. He was fighting the battles of the Lord. Was he going to live in the temple himself? Was he going to put his own name in the temple? He was doing everything for the Lord. He said, you consecrate yourself, clean yourself up, so that you can serve God. He was telling the priest and the Levites. Anything that is detestable, anything that is, you know, that is impure. Anything that is not supposed to be in the temple. He said, remove it. He was fighting the battles of the Lord to please the Lord. Let's go. So why will God not stand up for him in the day of his trouble? Are you still here? If you are still here, say amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm still here. I'm still here. How about you? Ask him, ask him, are you still here? 
Uh, uh, good. Now watch this. He said, because our fathers were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God, they abandoned him and turned their faces away from the Lord's tabernacle and turned their backs on him. This was what the people before him did. Let's go. They also closed the doors of the, what's this? Vestibule. Whatever that means, I'm sure it's the temple. Even me, I don't know the meaning of this one. Because he read differently in my own translation. They extinguished the lamps. Ah, yeah. You don't understand these things. Give me an IV. I want to explain something to you. Time will fail me. I would have given you some references for you to understand. Good. They shut the doors of the portico. So, the portico is an area. Now I understand this one. At least I didn't understand that other language. The portico is an area where they do some form of worship. Because there were different kinds of worship. There was worship through the altar of burnt offerings. Where they kill animals, they will pour the blood. And you know, those were, they were a shadow of the things to come. That Jesus was going to shed his blood. And you know, this is Easter. For you to understand, those were a shadow, an image of what was going to come. That when this Messiah comes, he will shed his blood. That was why when Jesus showed up, uh, what was his name? John the Baptist looked at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. This is the one that will shed his blood. The same way we used to kill lambs in the temple for the covering of sin. Now look at these people. They shut the doors of the place where we, they worship God. They put out the lamps. You might not understand what this means. Let me explain to you. You see, when the temple was built, if you go to the book of Leviticus chapter 6, when the temple was built, right, there was the, 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 there was one of the altars, because there were different altars. One of the altars had fire on it, right? But how did the fire come? When they finished building the temple and they built that particular altar, the way God told them to build it, God told the priest and the Levite, he said, step back. They step back. The Bible said fire came from heaven and landed on the altar. If that one happens before your eyes, will you not fear? Fire came from heaven and it landed on the altar and the fire was burning there. God now told them, he said, now, the work of the priests is to be putting wood in the fire because the fire on the altar must not go out. What did they do? They put it out. It did not go out by itself. Oh. They put it out. They put it out. Wicked people. They put out the lamps. They quench the fire of the spirit. Can we bring it home? They quench the fire of the spirit. Do you know what that represents? The operations of God in their midst. Because this, according to the types and shadow, represented the presence of the Holy Ghost in their midst. The continuous movement. When we say Holy Ghost fire, this was the type and shadow. And we must not put it out. You remember our teaching on the power of the spirit? We keep linking things because we are growing. So, they put it out. And they did not burn incense because there, is also, there was also another altar called the altar of incense where they burn incense to the Lord in the worship of the Lord. And they will stand there and be burning the incense and they will say, for the Lord is good and his mercy is endures forever. And the Lord will stay there and say, yes, my children are worshiping me and they are bowing before him, for the Lord is good and his mercy is endures forever. That's one statement that the Israelites never got tired of making because God told them to always make it. That's how to acknowledge him. So you want to acknowledge me, I'm around. They will say, for the Lord is good. His mercy is endures forever. For the Lord is good. His mercy is endures forever. And they do that when they burn the incense. But what did the Bible say? They did not burn incense or present any burnt on friends at the sanctuary to the God of Israel. They stopped everything completely. Let's go. Therefore, the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. It was because of all those things that the Lord became angry with them. 
He has made them an object of dread and horror and scorn, as you can see with your own eyes. This was Ezekiel talking to the priests and Levites. This is why our fathers are fallen by the sword. And why our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity. Because we have abandoned the service of the Lord. Let's go. Now, I intend to make a covenant with the Lord. This was a young boy of 25 years old. And this was the first thing he did when he became king. He said, I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. Verse 11. My sons, do not be negligent now. Tell your neighbor, don't be negligent now. Watch this. For the Lord has chosen you to stand before him. Tell your neighbor, the Lord has chosen you. You didn't say it very well. Say, the Lord has chosen you. So listen to me. You might not have seen an angel flapping his wings to say, Root, root, root. I, the Lord, have chosen you. No. You don't need to see an angel. That you are a child of God, that you are born again, you've come into his house now. What has happened? The Lord has chosen you in his service. That's why you are here. Do you know how many people we, we go out to invite? Do you know why you came? There is something in you that connects to the calling of God. The Lord has chosen you whether you believe it or not. Whether you know it or not. Whether you, are, whether you have a supernatural experience or not. You are here because the Lord has chosen you. Am I making sense to you? Say so don't be negligent now. The Lord has chosen you to stand before him. And to do what? Pray. To stand before him means to pray. Am I correct? You know we are talking about prayer and service to God. When you stand before God, do you just stand there and you are looking at him? To pray. To stand before him and to serve him. Watch this. To minister before him and to burn incense. To burn incense means to worship. That's what the Lord has called us to do as his children. To stand before him in prayer. To serve him with everything we have, with our very lives. To minister before him, standing before him, telling him how great he is. And to do what? To burn incense. The incense of worship. Some people don't worship God except when they are in church. As believers, we must build an altar of worship in our lives. So, you can imagine the kind of person he was. Some people here will say, you know, ah, pastor, don't worry. When I'm 50, I will start. Or when I'm like 70, when everything is winding down, I then I will start. Or when I'm 95, and I know that well, whether I like it or not, everything is drawing close. I will now serve God. No, that's not what God is looking for. This young man at the age of 25, he did not even know that he was going to face the days of darkness. He did not know that one day he was going to lie on the bed and it will be only God that can help him. He did not know. But he loved the Lord and he served the Lord. It was his service that he, remembered, he reminded God of when his day of trouble came. There are several other things that he did. Time will fail me because I can't go through all the things he did. If you go to chapter 30, go to chapter 30 verse 1. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. By this time, they had also stopped all the festivals in Israel. In particular, the Passover. And you know the Passover is very symbolic. Especially even at this time, you know, the blood of the Lamb. The Passover was symbolic of the coming of Christ. And God intentionally told the children of Israel, every year you must celebrate the Passover. One, to celebrate the fact that I rescued you with a mighty hand from the land of Egypt. But more importantly, to celebrate the fact that a Messiah is coming. And that when that Messiah comes, he's also going to deliver you from your sins and from the hand of the enemy. Let somebody say amen. amen. You didn't say a good amen. Come on, say amen. They had stopped this festival called the Passover. Ezekiah opened it again. Ezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. People who have stopped worshipping. What was he doing to the temple and the worship of God? Thank you. He was reviving the worship of God. The temple of the Lord. You know, if you read the scriptures in the book of um, Second Kings, in one of the chapters, 
In fact, when they shut down this temple, you don't know how strange it was. At a point, they could not even find the writings of the Bible again, you know, the Old Testament. The writings of Moses and um, the prophet, the Psalms. They didn't know where it was again. It was lost in the temple. They don't see him again. So when they were now cleaning it up during this exercise, you know what happened? One of the cleaners now just found it somewhere, on, like under the table. He said, I found a book. Oh. They now brought it out. And they said, oh, this is the book that they used to tell us about. The book of the word of the Lord. Ah, in the temple. Even the word of God was lost. Yeah. Even the, is the word of God not lost in, in most temples today? Don't take me to that one yet. So inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. So he revived the celebration of the Passover, which was very dear to God. Now, all of these things, some people say, oh, Pastor, what's all these Old Testament things that you are talking about? We are New Testament believers. I, I agree. Even me, man, I'm a New Testament believer. But do you know these things are for our learning? They are for us to learn what has happened in the past. They are for us to understand the things that are important to God. You know what this man, Ezekiah, did? He focused on the things that are important to God. He was not seeking anything for himself. That was why in the day of his trouble, he had built up a memorial before God. He had done the things that touched the heart of God and pleased God. To the extent that even he himself, he had the confidence to say, God, remember. It's me, oh, it's me. Oh. Don't let me go like this, Lord, remember, oh, it's me. Oh. You know, when people did not even support all the good things I was doing in the temple, I didn't stop. You remember that on the first month of my, of my reign as the king of Judah, the first thing I did was to open the doors of the temple. Lord, remember. Do you have anything to remind God of? If you are faced with trouble now, can you say, Lord, remember? The only thing for some people the Lord will remember is that you ate rice and chicken yesterday. Say, yeah, we both remember that one. But are you doing anything in the service of the Lord? It's not too late. But I'm telling you that this is important. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, it said the days of darkness, it happens to all men. The days of trouble happens to all men. But God steps in for some people. They are the people who, when everything was okay, they gave their time, their lives in the service of God. So he revived the Passover of the God of Israel. Go to verse 2, sir. I'm about to round up now because this is what the Lord just wants us to do. The king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decided to do what? To celebrate the Passover in the second month. They decided to celebrate the Passover. Do you have any decisions that are for the Lord? There are many things. Chapter, the whole of chapter 29, 30, 31, and 32 was dedicated to the acts of Ezekiah. I will encourage you to read it on your own. I hope you will. Let's look at verse 32, and I'm just going to stop there. Please jump to verse 32. So chapter 30, verse 32. He did so well in his service to God as the king. Verse 32, sir. Second Chronicles 30, 32. Is it not up to 30? Okay, maybe I jumped ahead of myself. Okay. Mm -mm. It's thirty two, thirty two, right? Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. It's chapter thirty two, verse thirty two. So I got that wrong. All right. And that's where I'm going to stop this morning. After dedicating four chapters to him in the book of Chronicles, he said the other events of Ezekiah's reign and his act of what? What was special about 
Cornelius. He was devoted. Look at now. This one lived many, 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 many years before Cornelius. And the Bible also talks about what? His act of what? He said the other events of Hezekiah's reign and his act of devotion are written in the vision of the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Acts of devotion. Acts of devotion. Listen, and this is a message for today. You can build up a memorial before God. The angel told Cornelius, he said, your prayers and your arms to the poor, your service to God, has risen as a memorial. God has taken note of it. Ask yourself, friends, and the same way I'm asking myself, is there anything I'm doing in the house of the Lord that God can take note of? And say, ah, Janet is doing this in my house. John is doing this in my house. Is there anything like that? Because you see, those things will become the points of reference the day you need God. In the day of trouble, in the day of darkness, those are the things that will be written in your own book of records that heaven will open. Somebody will say, ah, but this book of records, shall be still we get to heaven that they open it. Not exactly. Was it not open for Ezekiah while he was on earth? You remember the story of Mordecai? You remember the story of Mordecai in the book of Esther? How many people remember it? Everybody just saying yes. If I will tell you to tell me the story. You know I can always just pull trouble. Mordecai did something good. Although in, a, in the land where he was a, a, what do they call them? He was in captive. He was in captivity rather. There, he was on exile like the rest of the children of Israel. And some people were planning to kill the king. And he heard it. The story of Mordecai. I'm not going to that. It's in the book of Esther. And he heard it. And then he went. Or should we even look at it quickly? Just read that place. Some people say this pastor likes reading the Bible all the time. Yes, that's the work of the pastor. To be reading Bible. <laughs> Esther chapter 6 verse 1. And that time... He went and leaked it to the king. They said, some people are planning to kill you. And, they, and the king realized, and they took those people, and they executed them. But they didn't do any special thing for Mordecai. They left him alone. But one day, when the book of records will be open, one night, the Bible says, that night, the king could not sleep. The king didn't know what he was going to do. Because the day your book of remembrance will be open, the king will not be able to sleep. He says, so he ordered the book of, of what? Can you see again? The book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign to be brought, to be brought in and read to him. Let's go. It was found what? Recorded. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bithana and Teresh two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. He was the one that exposed them. Let's go. Now, hear what the king now said, the current king. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? Mordecai himself, think in his heart, I'm sure he thought the thing has been forgotten. Nobody remembered anymore. But the day when the book of records was opened, it was the king himself. And it was that same king that he protected. So you know the thing go do and wear well for mind. Say, ah, I've done that. If not for this young man. Come, what good thing, what honor have we given him? The king asked. And what did they say? Nothing has been done for him. His attendant answered. I don't want to go into the details. Then they honored him. Hear me, friends. You can build up a memorial before God with your prayers, and with your service. I always encourage people to pray. I shared with you last week that you can stop up prayers for yourself. Prayer is like having an account in a bank. You can store up a lot of prayers. That's why we pray consistently. We have the prayer team. We encourage you to join them in prayers. We have our early morning service, 8 to 8.45, before the service starts by 9 every Sunday. We come to pray. 
6.30, every Wednesday, 6.30 to 8, we come here, we pray. On Fridays, one hour, virtually, you can join from your phone from wherever, one hour, we pray. You know what you are doing? You are building up your prayer bank in heaven. So that the day you will need God to respond and you need heaven to respond, you are a man or a woman of prayer, they recognize you. Hallelujah. Amen. The same way, your service to God also is recorded. Do not waste your time. Do not ignore the responsibilities that God has given you in his house. And also, do not handle the work of God with levity. When it comes to the work of God, some of us handle it carelessly, with levity. We just do it anyhow we like. They say it's God's work now. God cannot come and kill me. Hmm. The day you will need him, I hope you will be able, like Ezekiah, to say, oh Lord, remember. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. I want us to bow down our heads and talk to the Lord where you are. Just talk to the Lord. You are going to ask God for grace. This is an important teaching. And it's supposed to impact how we work with the Lord, how we serve the Lord, how we handle the things of God in our lives and in his house. Say, Lord, give me grace. Give me grace. Lord, give me grace to, to, to serve you. Give me grace to be a man of prayer, to be a woman of prayer. So that in the days of need, I'm not going to be running helter-skelter. The full backing of heaven will be behind me. Come on, pray now. Come on, pray. You need to pray. me friends just one final thing you see great messages do not mean anything it's great decisions that brings a change and a difference i want you to make a decision i don't know how the world has touched you from last week to today why don't you make a decision maybe there is something god has been laying in your heart to do in his house and you have not done it make a decision now Maybe there is a team, there is a group in the house that the Lord has been telling you, join this unit and you have been slacking and just dragging your feet. Now make a decision. Make a decision. Say, Lord, I will do this. I don't know what God is prompting you to do, but make a decision. Is there a personal thing that the Lord wants you to do? Maybe the Lord has been prompting you, go and evangelize. Go and do this and you've not done it. Make a decision now. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. It's great decisions that make men. It's great decisions that brings about a change. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust the Lord. I want us to entrust ourselves onto the hands of the Lord. Say, Father, I look to you.
Lord will not bring you glory. The Lord, turn my eyes away from you. Grant me grace. Grant me the courage. Grant me the, the strength, Lord, to be all surrendered to you. Following your ways, following your instruction, doing everything that brings the light to your heart. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. us from purpose, everything that distracts us from following your will. Turn our eyes away from them in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture says they looked to him and they were lighted and their faces were not ashamed. Lord, as we look to you for direction, for instruction, grant us grace, Lord, to follow in your light in the name of Jesus. Amen. That we will not walk in the dark in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we follow you and following on to you, Lord, we will never be ashamed in the name of Jesus. Amen. On the day that you shall appear, Lord, we will not be ashamed. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We give you praise, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Shout hallelujah.